everything is learnable. Body language is learnable. Charisma is learnable. And that was such a relief. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we share all the secrets backed by science on how to build charisma and better people skills. From becoming less awkward in social situations to getting people to trust and respect you as a leader. This one is a must listen, one that I know you're going to want to share with all your friends as it's jam-packed with great advice and exercises to try. Our guest today is Vanessa Van Edwards. Vanessa Van Edwards is a multi-time best-selling author and renowned behavioral researcher on professional communication and leadership. More than 50 50 million people have seen Vanessa on YouTube and in her viral TED Talk. Vanessa's work has been featured in national and international media, including Inc., Entrepreneur Magazine, CNN, CBS, and many more. Her book, Captivate, has been translated into over 17 languages. Her latest book, Cues, Master the Secret Language of Charismatic Communication, was an instant bestseller. Before we begin, a quick reminder that New Year is around the corner, so make sure you grab a copy of the 2024 Artist of Life workbook to help you plan your best year in 2024. It's our best-selling guided journal filled with exercises to help you clarify what you want, plan out your year, and become the person you've always wanted to be. You can find it at shop.lavendaire.com. Hello, Vanessa. Welcome to our podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. Okay, so why don't you start by telling us how did you become an expert on people skills? Yes, I am a recovering awkward person. So people skills do not come naturally to me. And as an awkward person, I tend I always was misreading cues. I, I always was A worried people were mad at me. I would like leave a party and be like, is she mad at me? Right. <laughs> I was also always social overthinking. Social overthinkers, if this is you, if you're listening, it's like you rehash every conversation that you've had and everything you said and did. And you're like, oh yeah, I did that totally wrong. And it was, it was crippling. Like it was so hard. And so I started to search for advice to help me understand cues, to help me understand people, to help me in conversation. And I realized all the advice out there was written by extroverts. And if you're not a natural extrovert, which I am not, I'm not, I'm an ambivert. It's basically like people pretending to telling you to pretend to be more outgo- outgoing or people telling you to pretend to be more extroverted. And I was like, I don't want to fake it. And so I was like, there has to be a better way. And so I started for myself, categorizing body language cues, paying attention to conversational patterns, looking for social blueprints. Like what were the patterns and interactions? That's how my, my brain thinks. It's very analytical. And I slowly started sharing these tips. Turns out there was other awkward people in the world. They started to go viral. And I realized that we could study people like we study for science or math that we could actually understand patterns of behavior and that could help us be charismatic in our own authentic way without having to fake being an extrovert. Oh, that's so fun. I love that. I'm an introvert myself. So I relate to you saying all the work out there is written by extroverts, but introverts need like a different angle, right? So what were the main, I guess, main things you learned through that? So the first thing I learned, the big one was I thought that you you have, there are, there's only natural born charisma that you're either born charismatic or you're not. And I thought, well, I'm not, <laughs> I don't have it. I don't have that, that people gene guess I'm, that's me for the rest of my life. And what I was very encouraged to start to learn in research, but also talking to role models is that most charismatic people learned how to be charismatic. Yes, there are natural born, very charismatic extroverts, But most people, especially introverts and ambiverts, have learned to hone their charisma over time. So that was the the big thing that I learned, that everything is learnable. Mm. Body language is learnable. Charisma is learnable. And that was such a relief. Yeah. So what would you say are the building blocks of charisma then? And how can we learn to be more charismatic? Yeah. So when I first started in this work, I thought in an interaction, I had to be everything. I had to be funny and smart and impressive and outgoing and bubbly and you know all these <laughs> things. And it was so intimidating, right? I was like, there's no way I can go in there and be all these things. Luckily, groundbreaking research out of Princeton University looked at what actually makes people charismatic. And this study totally changed my life. It changed the way I interact. That being smart, being funny, being a good storyteller, those things are good. But actually what's most important in human to human interactions across genders and cultures and races is that you have two fundamental traits. And this is the formula for charisma. 
that highly charismatic people, what differentiates them from the control group is they are off the charts in warmth. So friendliness, trustworthiness, likability, but at the very same time, competence, capability, effectiveness. And there are people who are uneven. There are people who have a really high warmth or really high competence, but only very highly charismatic people hit that blend of both. Mm. So you're saying the balance has to be equal for them to be charismatic? Equal or within close a couple enough. degrees. Close, yes, uh. exactly. And I think actually the playground is that recipe of difference, right? So like mm-hmm. you can be a little higher in warmth, but you have to have enough competence to match it. You can That's be a little so higher in competence, but you have to have warmth. And so my entire goal, like I wrote an entire book about this, is that playground, mm. that sweet spot of what is your recipe for charisma, right? Like we can't all be the same kind of charisma. That would be boring. So, okay, if there are, I, in my research, I discovered there are 97 different cues. We send these cues through our body language, our face, our voice, our ornaments, like what's behind us or our, what we're wearing. Okay, if there's 97 cues, we can actually use different cues to make our charisma soup or charisma <laughs> cake, if right. you will, right? There are you know, 13 warmth cues, there are 14 competence cues. So you can pick and choose the ones that work for you. And that's actually what makes someone charismatic in a very like systematic way. All right, let's take a quick break for our sponsor, Uncommon Goods. If you haven't finished your holiday shopping yet, don't panic. There is still time to find incredible original gifts with the help of Uncommon Goods. Uncommongoods.com has the absolute best gifts for everyone in your life. They have unique and creative gifts, often handmade by independent artists and makers. I was browsing some gifts for my family, and I like that you can filter based on who you're shopping for and what hobbies they're into. For example, my brother likes coding and games, and I found this create your own video game set that includes a console that builds and runs retro arcade games. It's a unique way to learn coding through creating your own games. Uncommon Goods finds products that are high quality and out of the ordinary. From art and jewelry to kitchen, home, and bar, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash TLL. That's uncommongoods.com slash TLL for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon goods. We're all out of the ordinary. Okay. So can you give us like an example? Like you can use yourself as an example. Like what are the cues? Yeah. Sure. I'll give you a bad example first. So actually in the research, and this is all based on the research, they found that there are sort of four areas. There's very highly charismatic people, the people who are high in warmth and competence. There are people who are higher in warmth without showing enough competence. There are people who are very high in competence without showing enough warmth. And the last one I think is actually the the worst one. I call it the danger zone. That's not enough of either warmth Mm -hmm. or competence. I see. And so I think the biggest mistake that people make is they think being stoic or not showing their emotions makes them more powerful, but actually not showing enough cues takes away both your warmth and competence. So that, that was me. That was where I was. I just shut down. Like I wasn't sure what to do. So I just did nothing, which is like the worst thing to do at all. So for example, someone could hop on a video call and be like totally blank, right? This works on video call. This works on the phone. We actually, there's a lot of vocal cues as well. Emails. We also dictate warmth and confidence in our emails and our Slack and our profiles. It's not just in person. We're doing it all the time. So someone would hop on video and be kind of stoic, right? Like not showing any facial expressions, not showing any gestures. If I wanted to be highly charismatic on video, I would want to add first warmth. We like to see warmth first. They are chronological. Mm -hmm. So a warmth cue would be um, a visible palm. That sounds like a very specific cue, but we actually, as humans, our brains like to see someone else's palm. It's like a caveman instinct. Mm, That's why we Um, wave high. That's why we wave high. You (laughs) you see a friend across the room, you're like, hi, you wave. That's universal. Mm -hmm. Universal, right? Um, Like, like, you know, that's why like when we're showing that we're we're innocent, we hold our hands up. Like I didn't do it. mm -hmm. You know, we hold, we show our palms. So this is a universal cue that immediately triggers warmth. I talk, I break this down in my TED talk of how when we see a palm, our brain just relaxes. Okay. So we hop on a video, we show our palm. Hey, nice to see you. We wave, right? And we typically partner it with another warmth cue, like a smile um, or potentially a nod. Like you're nodding okay. at me. That's a warmth. <laughs> right. So, okay. Those are three warm, little warm cues in a row. Palm, smile, nod. Wow. Beautiful. We want to balance it out with three competence cues. 
right? So a confidence cue could be direct eye contact. So for example, I have my my whole setup. You can't see it, but it's positioned so that like I am looking right at the camera on my eye level and I can still see your face. Yeah. It's really close to the camera. So I can still see you right. while I'm also making eye contact versus people who are looking down at the screen and not making eye contact the entire time. Yeah, it makes a big difference. Huge mm-hmm. difference. Like it would be very hard to connect with me if I was looking off camera right. or even off to the side. So that's competence. Mm-hmm. The second competence cue is the kinds of words we use, right? So if I say, you know, it's so great to see you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm directly addressing you. That's not super high competence, but a question. So asking something like, you know, working on anything exciting recently, or, um, you know, give me an update on the highlight of your week. Those kinds of very specific questions are used by highly competent people. And then also a low tone. So I always say hello instead of, Hey, good to see you, (laughs) which is a huge mistake people make. Why, why Why do low tones work better than higher tones? And this makes sense from a biological perspective. Uh So when you are anxious, you hold your breath, which makes you kind of speak up here. And then also your vocal cords tighten, which makes you go a little bit higher in your vocal cords. And then your shoulders tighten, which also makes you go a little higher. And that's why we end up starting a call with, hey, good to see you. Right. (laughs) Right. So it's all biological. So if I'm relaxed, I've taken a deep breath. I'm speaking on the out breath. My shoulders are relaxed. My vocal cords relax. My jaw is relaxed. And I'm able to speak more relaxed. So it's all for a reason. These cues are not, they're subconscious. And that's why we can read them is because they, across cultures and genders, now of course there is cultural cues. Don't get me wrong. There are Mm -hmm. some cultural cues. But in my book, I try to teach the majority of the cues. They come from biological reasons, which excites me, right? Like I want to know that something works and I want to know why it works. Like that's why my my brain works that way. Like I'll give you another example of of a cue. So um, if you harden your lower lids, so actually a better way to think about this is wherever you are right now, try to see something far away. Like try to look as far as you possibly can. Instinctively, you will harden your lower lid to Mm -hmm. see as far away as possible. That's called a lower lid flex. And a lower lid flex is what we do when we're trying to see more details. When we're trying to take in as much of the environment as possible, we widen our eyes. Like we widen in surprise or fear. When we're trying to see something really well, we we harden or squint our eyes. Yep. That is a biological response. Okay, this is where it gets interesting. Okay, so if we know that we do that to, and the reason we do that, by the way, is we, when we harden our lids, it blocks the amount of light coming into our eyes so we can actually see more detail. That is why we do that. It's a, it's a way that we control the light. You will notice if you read um, People's Sexiest Man Alive, like that issue, almost every man in that issue is lower lid flexing. Right. <laughs> And that is because we like a man who is intensely focused on us, seeing <laughs> our details. That's funny. Yeah. And so in, in on dates, in pictures, on meetings, we find it kind of attractive when someone hardens their lower lid at you because we're like, oh, they're intensely focused <laughs> on me. Now, this, there's positive and negatives to this. Yes, it can be attractive in a romantic situation, but in a meeting or a negotiation or a pitch it can actually be someone scrutinizing you, Mm -hmm. scrutinizing your idea. So in this way, like if I'm in a negotiation or if I'm on a video call and I see, if I'm saying something and someone all of a sudden hardens their lower lids at me, I know I just said something that made them be like, really? Really, Vanessa? And that's when I'm like, pause. Have any questions? Does this make sense? Let's review this slide again. And so there's like the feedback loop of, yes, there's also, there's cues you want to show, but there's also cues that you can decode. Okay. I see. Wow. Okay. And can you go, like, can you explain competence a little bit more? Because I think a lot of people, I mean, I would think it competence means your skills, but some, you know, what does it mean in this sense? No, that's a good clarification. So competence in this setting, you're right. You know, obviously if someone's competent, they're good at what they do, but in, in a brief first impression, we can't tell if you're a good programmer, right? Like I couldn't know if you were expert at your job. So competence in a first impression sense or in a relational sense is actually, can I rely on you? So the questions that are asked for warmth. So warmth, can I trust you? Okay. Competence, can I rely on you? Uh, In other words, can I rely that you're going to get it done? That you're saying what you're saying is true, that um, you've done your research, whatever that means. And so we're looking for perceived reliability because we like people, obviously, who are both warm and trustworthy, but also can get it done. Yeah. We like people who are 
Yep. Yes, efficient and capable and reliable and true to their word. So it's a good that, that's a good clarification. It's really true to their word and reliable. That's okay. kind of the that makes that. sense. Because to me, that seems like people who are confident. That's why we're drawn to people who are confident. They they seem more competent. Right? Well, or that's no? a good question because okay. confident people could be confident but not competent. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Like Boy, you could right. have someone who's like. You, everyone knows this person. Like, I'm sure you know this person. <laughs> it's like someone who's super confident in their own abilities, but you're not. Right. right. <laughs> so, so how do you like, explain that? It's so it's different then. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, narcissists can show <laughs> confidence that isn't based in reality. Right. right? So right. like, I, I love confidence. Don't get me wrong. And I've, I've considered writing, I have a book, Captivate. I have a book, Cues. I have considered writing a book called Confidence, but I'm not. I'm not going to, not yet at least, don't check back with me in 10 years, but I'm not going to because I think confidence is a fleeting state, right? Like you can wake up and feel confident for a moment and then, you know, you get bogged down in your day or you have imposter and it goes away. It's a really hard state to stay in. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Whereas I think warmth, being genuinely trustworthy as a person, being a person who sees the best in others, caring for others, that is a state I want to be in. I want to occupy that state. I don't want to go away. Competence, reliability, um, being dependable on my word, being capable, that is a state I want to stay in. So I think that that's, I love confidence. Don't get me wrong. I just, it's something that I don't chase anymore. I see. Awesome. Okay. So I have some questions for, you know, you giving advice from your point of view to our listeners. So the first one is what is your advice for instantly becoming less awkward? And maybe we can use two examples like social party with friends and then workplace. So instantly becoming less awkward, or is it the same for both situations? I think okay. it's the same. There's a couple, but the one that I think would work for both scenarios is do not worry about impressing people like literally throw that out the window. And the reason for that is because it is so awkward producing. It's, it makes you so awkward to be like, I have to impress this person. They have to like me, right? Like that is so hard. So I want you to not think about them liking you. Don't think about them impressing you. And instead I want you to remember this study. So this is a study that also changed the way I interact and perceive people. It was, uh, researchers went to high schools and they studied thousands of high school kids looking for patterns of popular kids, like the most liked kids. They wanted to know, are the most popular kids the smartest, the best athletes, the funniest, you know, the prettiest? What was it about them that made them so popular? It was none of those things. It did not have to do with their attractiveness. or pretty, like There were attractive kids who were also popular, but that was not the through line across all these schools and all these grades. What made the most popular kids popular was that they had the longest list of people that they liked. Uh, in other words, the only differentiator was when they asked in this long survey, they gave all these kids, how many people at your school do you like? They had the longest lists. <laughs> you mean the, the popular kid themselves liked a lot of yes. people. So they were yes. friendly and warm probably it, to everyone. And they liked a lot of people. Uh -huh. So <laughs> what I would say is the fastest way to be more likable and not be awkward is to be like, how can I like this person? 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 When I'm going in an interaction, that is all I am thinking about. I'm like, mm. forget everything else. I'm like, what can I ask to like this person? What can we talk about to like this person? How can I like this person more? That intention is so empowering because it's curious, it's empathetic, it's warm, and it immediately makes you more likable without having to impress anyone. Mm-hmm. Wow. So this kind of reminds me of something I saw on a, a, like on a TV show. They were having this conversation. Um, if there is a person that you dislike or someone that like gets on your nerves, find a way yeah. to like them. <laughs> Have yeah. you tried that? And does that, yeah. Look, yes, but I'm going to mm -hmm. give a yes, but yeah. yes. Like if you have a difficult person, I want you to try your darndest to like that person, you know, kill them with likes, right? Like <laughs> What do we have in common? How can I like this person? To an extent, mm -hmm. right? I, I have a three strike rule. If you have tried and tried and tried three times, and I mean really tried, like I mean like really put your all into it, went into it with really good questions, tried to find likable moments, tried to find me two moments, gave them different contexts, maybe in work, maybe outside of work. And by the third time, 
you're still not feeling it, they're not your person. Yeah. They're Don't not force your person. It. And you cannot change them. Like we cannot fix difficult people. We can change the way that we treat them so they are less difficult towards us, but we cannot change them. Yeah. Okay. So moving on, conversation tips. Like, can you share how do you start conversations? How do you keep a conversation going? Yes. Okay. So building on going into a situation looking to be likable, like a little mental game you can play with yourself is how can I approach this conversation with questions that will unearth our commonalities? Okay. This is why I want you to banish, like, please let's go on a diet. Do not ask, what do you do? How are you? How's it going? Where are you from? No more. That is because they are totally autopilot questions. We're socially scripted. If you ask someone, how are you? I'm going to tell you what their answer is. Their answer is going to be, oh, busy. Good, but so busy. Like that is everyone's answer or fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so One is you will be in a conversation trap if you ask those questions. And it's really hard to dig yourself out of that trap once you're there. So instead of those questions, I would rather you ask these questions. So what's good? It's like hop on the call. So what's good? What's been good lately? It it breaks the social script. It's still safe. Like it's not like, what's your deepest dreams? Like it's not like it's not like so, you know, deep, but it's still like a little safe, but it breaks social script. It's like, oh, what's good? Yeah. Right. So it makes them search for it. Slightly different. Mm Mm-hmm. Slightly different. And then the second one is instead of asking what do you do, ask, working on anything exciting recently. This works because you're giving them permission to tell you what they're working on. Because some people who aren't defined by their work don't like their work. Asking them what they, do they do immediately puts them in cortisol, immediately puts them in a fear place. Yeah. So what? even when you ask that question, anything exciting you're working on, it could be something outside of work as well. Exactly. It could yeah. be anything. You're, it's a permission question. It's a question to like say, that. I'm going to let you tell me whatever excites you. And then we can talk about only good things. <laughs> as soon as you ask someone like, how's work? And they're like, oh man, like we're going through layoffs and I might get fired tomorrow. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, like you don't know how, how to respond to some things. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's talk about that. I guess when a conversation starts to die down, what are some ways to like kick, keep it going or jumpstart it? Well, I have a radical opinion here, which is if a conversation is dying down, like I'm out skis. Okay. So you're not forcing it. No. I mean, you know, especially at a holiday party or like, you know, a friend of a friend, like if it's your boss, no, keep going. Like, please keep going. But like if, if it's someone that's like, you're not close with, I'm, I'm like, cool. Like we got some good little anecdotes. Like I, this was great talking to you. I'm going to like go to the bar. Bye. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. That's, that's another thing. Like how do you exit conversations that are uncomfortable? Just like that. But just like that. <laughs> It's been so great talking to you. I'm going to go to the bathroom. Or it's so great talking to you. I'm going to go talk to the host. It's been so great talking to you. I'm going to go outside. Like, that's it. Like, end it. Like, if I feel that sizzle, that fizzle, I should say, and I'm just like, we did it. We had a good conversation. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. So that's first. Okay. If it is someone important to you, like a boss or potential date, and you're like, uh uh-oh, like, there's quiet and like, (laughs) I want... Oh, well, yes. I have a couple of like back pocket questions that I like that you can just, that are more, that are comfortable for you. So for example, in that moment, I often will ask, so have you listened to any good podcast recently? I'm looking for something new. So like I ask for some kind of advice, a new book, a new show, a new podcast to like give us something else to talk about. I think asking for advice is like a very quick way to inject energy into the conversation. Okay. So next I want to ask about self-esteem because I think a big part of it is just like feeling worthy, right? In a comp- like instead of being all awkward and making yourself s- small, what are your best advice for building self-esteem? Oh my goodness. This is a hard one. I mean, how did you go from awkward to the confident level that you are now? Well, I'm still awkward. You know, I'm <laughs> no, recovering. I don't think so. But yeah, you are recovering. I'm recovering and I yes. do feel I like I I know my patterns. I think that's part of it is like knowing what who and what makes you awkward mm-hmm. and like being very, very conscious about your social energy. If you have a long day, you look at your phone battery and you're like, better plug in now. <laughs> or you're like, better not run like five Instagram videos because like I I gotta make it till 10 PM. It's kind of the same with our social battery. And I think that's a very important part of self-esteem. Like it's a muscle, right? So you don't want to exhaust it. So one is like trying to be around people who lift you up. It's so easy to have high self-esteem if there are people who like love you and support you. Like I don't have a ton of friends, but my friends are awesome, right? Like the friends I have are amazing because I went through a culling 
it's like a terrible thing. Like I went through like a culling early on where I was like, when I'm, when I see that person's name on my calendar, I feel dread. Like I, I don't want to, or like when I leave hanging out with them, I do not feel good, but I don't know why. Like th- that person's not toxic. They're not difficult, but I left feeling exhausted or like, just like meh would have yeah. been better to be in my PJs. <laughs> and so like if it's not a heck yes with someone and you're like ambivalent about them, it's really hard to keep up your self-esteem. Same thing with, with tasks, places, activities, try it once. And if it's not, if you're not like, yeah, I feel better. Don't do it. Don't do it. I love that you give yourself permission to to follow that energy because it's there for a reason. Yeah, or like blame me. Be like Vanessa said. Vanessa said that I should say no to this person. Just blame me. That's okay. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So next is, I mean, we kind of talked about this, your framework for like approaching and connecting with people. Cause sometimes there are people who are so different from you that you don't like, how, how do you connect with anyone? Like, what is the secret? Everyone has a story, right? Like I like people who are radically different than me, right? Like, yes, I like people who are similar to me, but like Oftentimes I'm amazed by people who are different than me. So right. going into it being like, I just want to find reasons to like this person, whether mm. we agree on things, whether we don't, is like a very, like, it's a free, I think it's a very freedom framework. Like it lets you be like, cool. Like I totally disagree with this person politically or religiously <laughs> or whatever, but like we're cool and they're fascinating. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I mean, if only everybody could think like that <laughs> with all of our differing beliefs, you know, this is my goal, friend. This is my goal. Like every podcast, we're going to help people just approach people who are different than you with love and liking. That's I it. love that. <laughs> and then for people who are leaders or trying to build their leadership skills, we talked about competence, right? I, I, I would assume that's a big part of it. So how do you get people to respect you and to, to follow you? So leaders can be are high in warmth and competence. They can lean a little higher in competence. I think that um, when we're talking about leadership, and this is a that's a very big topic. Like I could yeah. almost write a whole book. I know, on, I know, <laughs> on just leadership. But if I had to sort of distill it, I think being hyper dependable is what we want from our leaders, especially right now. Like right now, in a time of like fear and a lot of like not knowing, and we're not having a lot of in person connections, and our connections are feeling very weak, it's so important to show up and be, I'm here for you. You can rely on me, you can rely on my word. And that means having a very high commit complete ratio. Mm-hmm. So, something I teach my students, my leadership students, is your commit complete ratio has to be high. Commit complete ratio is think of all the projects that you've committed to in the last year. How many of them have you completed? How many projects have you committed to with your team? How many projects have you committed to with your friends? Or how many times have you committed to something and then backed out? If you want to be a a successful leader, especially right now, your complete ratio should be high. It should be 90% or higher because that makes you hyper-dependable. Yep. So that means don't commit to anything you're not going to actually do. That means knowing yourself, right? Like that means knowing I'm going to probably cancel that. I'm going to say no. I'm going to protect myself. I would rather you have a really high commit complete ratio and under committing. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. saying yes to only the stuff that you know that you can fill and fulfill well. I love that. Very powerful. So the last thing is, is there any practical exercise that you can share that listeners can take away and try today? Like whether it's body posture, like anything. Okay. So I'll, I'll give two. So one is I, I, we have a free quiz on testing your warmth and competence. So if you are like, where am I on the scale? We actually have a quiz based on the research. It's free. You can take it as many times as you want. It's scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. Very easy. A challenge is take it yourself and then send it to a partner or a colleague or a friend and have them take it as you oh, and screenshot the results. I love that. Okay. <laughs> because your perception of your warmth and competence might be different than other people's perception of your work and competence. Okay. Yeah. So that's like a very practical and really beautiful exercise if you're willing to do it, like yourself Mm -hmm. and others. But if you just want to do something right now, it would be to think about um, the five people you spend the most time with in your life. Are they all contributing to your social battery? Like when you're with them, does it feel like plugging in your phone or does it feel like running five apps at the same time? (laughs) If someone does not, if that's not like a heck yes for those, for all five of those people, like consider um, gently asking them to exit or putting boundaries around them to see them less. 
Yeah. Love that. All right. Vanessa, do you have any final message you'd like to share with our listeners today? I think that, you know, my goal for doing this work is to help recovering awkward people feel less awkward. Yes. But it's also to try to approach people with genuine warmth and genuine kindness and genuine reliability. So yes, I can teach you all the cues for warmth and competence, but if you're not actually warm and competent, it's not <laughs> going to work all for fake, it's not going to, it's not going to come off right. It'll work for a little bit. It'll work for a little, but it won't work for very long. So before you even learn all 97 cues, they're great. I, I want you to ask yourself, like, can I be more reliable in my life? Like, is there something I can do to have a higher commit complete ratio? Can I be more warm in my life? Like, can I assume the positive about people? Can I make sure that the people in my life, I actually genuinely care about them? That is true warmth and true competence. And that is my real goal for this work is to help people find that in themselves first. Love that. All right. Where can we find you online? Oh, yes. So um, at my books, I read on Audible if you like if you like my voice. Oh, <laughs> um, wow. Yes. How long does it take uh, to record a book? I've always been curious. Oh, at least four days. Okay. At least four days. Wow. Yeah, it's four days of work for like seven hours of Oh my recording. gosh. Nonstop, yeah. just reading. Like reading I it can only do like five hours a day. So it's like yeah, four or five hour days. It's okay. so much. It's so much. <laughs> um, so please go read the auto, go listen to the audio yeah. book because it was a lot of effort. Yeah. Um, and so Cues is my most recent book. Captivate is my first book. Um, also, I put out a ton of free content. I do a free video every week since 2007. So we have hundreds of videos on this topic at scienceofpeople.com. Amazing. Everyone, I'll share all the links down below. Definitely check out Vanessa. She's amazing. I had so much fun today. It was Yay. so punchy. So many good takeaways. Thank you. Oh my gosh, you're the best. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for listening. <laughs> <laughs>